Hello everybody, welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips. One of the problems with lying and other forms of misbehavior is that sooner or later the truth comes up, comes out almost about everything, and that even includes diet and health care. And it's really good news for consumers. I think the internet has helped with that a lot. The truth is getting circulated. Um, but it's real bad news for food companies, it's bad news for lobbying organizations and drug companies and medical institutions, and also for federal agencies that facilitate some of the misbehavior. So I'm going to tell you about a recent episode, and the reason I'm covering this is because what happened is being misconstrued. I'll get to that at the end. I would have normally left this alone as just one more example of how corrupt everything is, but I have a reason for wanting to talk about this. So a researcher at the University of California looked into the, this issue with the sugar industry, uh, convincing the role of the sugar industry and convincing people, uh, healthcare organizations, government agencies, etc., that sugar consumption did not increase the risk of heart disease. Stanton Glantz is the guy who was the head researcher and his colleagues reviewed internal documents from the Sugar Research Foundation, which is now called the Sugar Association. The group discovered that the association paid three Harvard academics, an amount equal to about $50,000 in today's terms, uh, to publish a review of the research concerning the connection between sugar and heart disease and fat and heart disease. Predictably, the article, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, reported that there was little evidence to support the idea that sugar was a problem, but where was there a lot of evidence to support the idea that saturated fat was a problem and led to uh, increased risk of heart disease. The documents disclosing the collaboration between the sugar industry and the Harvard researchers were archived in libraries at universities, including Harvard and the University of Illinois. So that's part of what happens is there's evidence lurking out there for almost everything that's happened and sooner or later it surfaces. So the documents reveal that in 1964, a sugar industry executive by the name of John Hickson developed a plan to change the public's perception about sugar through a combination of industry-sponsored research and legislative um, action. Um, what he wanted to do was to influence public policy so that people would not be afraid to eat sugar. Some studies had shown a relationship between high intake of sugar and increasing incidence of heart disease, and Hickson told his colleagues at the time that research could refute a lot of this and put people's minds to rest. Well, there, there were three Harvard academics involved in this. I'm familiar with two out of the three. The third person I didn't know anything about. One of um, the Harvard researchers was Dr. Frederick Stair, who was chairman of Harvard's nutrition department, and he was a true friend to industry. While at Harvard, he received funding from Nabisco, Kellogg's, and the Cereal Institute. Uh, after he left Harvard, he was a co-founder of the American Council on Science and Health, which took millions of dollars from any company willing to pay it in exchange for advocacy work. While, chair was, while Lester was chairman of the board at the ACSH, he asked Philip Morris for funding in a letter, which I read, you can see it online now, stating how beneficial it would be for the company to contribute. The decision to um, associate with an organization like ACSH is pretty questionable since most of the organization's budget came from industry and several of the documents that I looked at clearly showed that um, there was almost an express promise to uh, do something to promote the point of view of the manufacturer or company involved uh, if that company would contribute money. And I had written a lot of things about this organization in the past. Um, one tax return that I reviewed, there must have been a hundred and some drug companies and chemical makers and um, agricultural organizations and food manufacturers all paying for favorable coverage of whatever it was that they made. And as if that's not bad enough, ACSH's executive director uh, during the time that Steer was, um, was uh, involved was Dr. Gilbert Ross, who was convicted of defrauding New York State's medical Medicaid program for $8 million and spent 23 months in prison. What a great group of people. Now, one might think that Harvard would be distressed to have a researcher on staff with such questionable associations, but one would be wrong and nothing has changed. In 2009, the New York Times broke a story reporting that a student in a first-year pharmacology class became really concerned when a teacher was touting the benefits of statin drugs, and then when the class started to question the, the teacher about side effects, the teacher had what was considered an overblown reaction. So in response, the student investigated and he found that this particular professor was a paid consultant to 10 drug companies, five of which made statin drugs. 
Angry students pressured the school to change its policies and faculty members were then forced to disclose their industry ties. One teacher listed 47 corporate affiliations and the um, dean of Harvard Medical School at the time, a guy by the name of Jeffrey Flyer, he issued a public statement saying that the Harvard Medical School faculty might be the leader in, in the nation in terms of receiving money from industry, as if that's something to be proud of. I mean, I don't think I would say that to the press if it were me, but anyway. Um, disclosure documents at the time of this event that I'm telling you about showed that 149 faculty members had ties to Pfizer and 130 of them had ties to Merck. Now, that's not all. Dr. Joseph Biederman is another Harvard superstar. He's still there. He's credited with increasing the diagnosis of bipolar disease in children 40-fold from 1994 to 2003 while receiving over $1.6 million from the drug companies, which he failed to disclose to Harvard. I don't know if he, uh, as is required by his contract, I don't know if he just forgot. I would think that I would remember $1.6 million. Um, there were even some emails back and forth between the drug companies and Biederman about how he should spin the data because the data wasn't really supporting his hypothesis. Um, so Harvard remains an institution that's plagued with conflicts of interest historically and now doesn't seem to have any interest in doing anything about it. Now another author of this sugar article that is the topic of this whole thing uh, was Mark Hedgstead who later became um, the head of nutrition at the United States Department of Agriculture where he was involved in drafting the government's dietary guidelines. So his industry friendly training at Harvard made uh, for a perfect career training for him to move to uh, industry friendly career at the USDA. I didn't know anything about the other researchers, so I can't really comment. I'm sure he was, I, I'm, I shouldn't say I'm sure. We, one could guess that he might not have been a great actor based on his, the company he keeps. All right, so Hickson paid the researchers. He actually provided them with the papers that he wanted included in their review. And the documents are very clear, if you look at them, that what he expected was that they would report that sugar was not a culprit in heart disease. The Harvard trio was only too happy to comply. Hegstead wrote, quote, we are well aware of your particular interest and we will cover this as well as we can. So this was a really collaborative relationship. The Harvard team shared drafts of the article that they were going to write, which showed that saturated fat was the culprit and sugar wasn't with Hickson, who said he was quite pleased with what he read. He wrote, let me assure you, this is quite what we had in mind and we look forward to its appearance in print. One of the reasons why this arrangement remained a secret for all this time is that at the time that the article was published, the New England Journal of Medicine did not require financial disclosures by authors, and they have since changed that policy. But disclosure hasn't really changed the way things are done. Conflicts of this type and misbehavior of this type go on all the time. Those of you who've been watching this YouTube channel for a long time know because you've heard me talk about it. It's ongoing. Unfortunately, knowledge that the sugar industry bought and paid for research that suited its marketing purposes is now being used to perpetrate even bigger lies and misrepresentations. An article in the New York Times could lead somebody to believe that focusing on fat as a cause of heart disease was misleading and that everyone should have been and still should be interested more in sugar than fat. And that's really why I wanted to cover this because um, in addition to all the background on some of these people, which I thought you would find interesting. It's disconcerting to me that um, the uh, folks that promote animal food-based diet are using this to show that they were right all along. The Times article reported that Dr. Hegstead referenced the article he co-authored when working on the government's dietary guidelines, and as a result, saturated fat was portrayed as the main risk factor for heart disease. Um, and sugar was described as just being a source of empty calories and uh, increasing the risk of tooth decay. The Times reports that the government continues to caution Americans about saturated fat, and the implication that I took from the article is, well, maybe this isn't good advice. Dr. Glantz told the Times that as a result of the Harvard researchers' review, health authorities stopped talking about sugar so much and started promoting low-fat diets, and again, the tone of the article, and you can read it yourself, it's uh, referenced in this article, is that you know, maybe it was a mistake to spend so much time on saturated fat. Well, the reality is trying to choose a food, a nutrient, either as a hero to solve your problems or a villain, which is the cause of all your problems, has never worked. It's not a good idea. It's a form of reductionism. It is not a single nutrient that causes the problem. If you stop eating sugar, but you keep eating a high diet high in fat, you're still going to have health issues. If you eat a very low fat diet and you eat a bunch of processed garbage with a lot of sugar, you're still going to have health problems. It is only when you change the dietary pattern that you see things you know, improving in terms 
terms of health status. So um, this whole discussion that has now come out of this mess has, is even more misleading. So, so let's take a look at what we have here. We have um, academic people at, at Harvard, academics at Harvard, who are, are actually putting themselves up for sale. I told, titled this article, Science for Sale. So you have academics at Harvard whose opinions are for sale, who write an article that's probably very misleading. I didn't read the original article. That was somewhat irrelevant based on what I'm telling you here. And that article, that, that bought and paid for article, then influences public policy. Um, and really, we should have been talking to people about saturated fat anyway. So now the whole story comes out and, and people are misusing the misrepresented information here to perpetrate more misunderstandings and misrepresentations. And the whole thing can actually make your head hurt if you let it. Um, some days I just have to take a break from all this, I have to say. So anyway, the bottom line, the, the, the consumer of information has to be aware. You hear me talking all the time about how, how the consumer needs to be aware uh, and be wary of health providers and the recommendations that they make. You need to be a really discerning consumer about uh, information as well. All right, that's all for today. As usual, pass this on to somebody else who you think would enjoy watching it. And I will be back to you next week with more news.